أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله Yesterday we began a topic on the different sayings of Imam Hussein alayhi salam from Medina all the way to Karbala. The reason I explained yesterday that we took up this topic and it seemed like it's an important topic to cover is that as time goes on, brothers and sisters, as we get more and more involved and as, more, as Muslims get more and more involved in, and engaged in the world around them, there will be more mention of Imam Hussein Whether the enemies of, him, of his eminence, of his greatness, like it or not. At the same time, we as the Shia of Abu Abdullah, who are carrying this banner, we are carrying this flag, carrying this torch of Imam Hussein and Ashura, it is imperative that we at least have an idea of the direction, the vision that Imam Hussein had regarding what he did. Sometimes as we grow up, as we're through our younger age and those younger years as we grow, we hear different things. We hear different interpretations of Imam Hussein's movement. There are different explanations. Sometimes even some of the goals and ultimate aims that Imam Hussein had that some will tell us might go against what others tell us. The least is that our next generation gets familiar with at least what he said in this period of Medina to Karbala. Now if Allah wills, we can even move further. What do I mean? Usually we know about Imam Hussein on the day of Ashura, yes? And then if we're really lucky, we know about him in those first 10 days of Muharram, what happened, you know. Now we're moving time in the future, we can get to know him even before he left Medina for Karbala. His lifetime, during Muawiyah's time, how was he? His interaction with Muawiyah even, yes? But it seems that the most important part of his life for us, at least, at least, for us to be able to make the right judgments, to be able to understand what he was after, to an extent, is to see what he's had to say. <laughs> it's very simple. What he had to say after it all began, and he had to leave Medina. The things that he said in Mecca, on his way to Mecca, after he left Mecca. If we don't know what he said, at least, then of course, that I, it, feel, it seems that we might be mistaken sometimes when it comes to understanding what he was all about, what he was after. Before you know it, some of us might be doing certain things in his name while what we're doing actually defeats the purpose, defeats the goal. So that's the point of these lectures. We are going through the different things Abu Abdullah had to say, as if the different things he had to say to us once he left Medina. It's as if when he's leaving Medina for Karbala, He's letting the world know, okay, people of the world, if you ever come later, whether it's a hundred years later, whether it's a thousand years later, and you want to know what I was all about, this is what I was all about. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. These are the different things I said. Of course he's going to say the most important things in this period that have to do with his movement. That is what we are pursuing these nights, inshallah. Recite a salawat. Alhamdulillah, last night we put behind us three of the things that, and sayings that he had in Medina from the first day where it all began. Moving on to another one of those accounts. And it, there's a benefit in this for us, not only at what I explained right now in the introduction, but also there's a benefit in it for us. It gets us more and more familiar with the history as well. The people that were involved and how they were as well. As we go on these nights, you'll see. Not only we're we taking lesson from what he says, Imam Hussein, we're taking lesson.
lesson from the people that were around him and the questions they had and the answers he gave them and sometimes the scolding that he did of certain people who weren't joining him and so on and so forth. All of this is relevant to our lives today. If we want to not despair, inshallah, although we might be struggling in life, we might be uh, uh, you know, experiencing the ups and downs in life, if we at least know we're on the path of Abba Abdullah, it'll give us a little bit of hope. This next account that we have for tonight is, if you remember yesterday, those who were here, I said that when Imam Hussein wanted to leave Medina for Karbala, or for now let's say for Mecca, and knew that there is no way except that he leaves Medina, he can't stay in Medina. If he stays, it's either bay'ah or death. Okay, there's no third option, I'll make a third option, I'll leave altogether. So he left for Mecca. Between that time where they asked him for bay'ah and he left for Mecca, they say he went to the grave of the Prophet a lot. It's interesting that how the Imams would make it a point to everybody around them that, hey, I have close kinship and blood relations with the Holy Prophet of Allah. Back then, brothers and sisters, it wasn't like today. Today, 1400 years have passed. Ulama have done research, have studied the works, studied the ahadith. And we have this concept of imamah today that we believe in. Back then, during Imam Hussein's time, the ones who even joined him later on, they didn't have that concept of imamah the way we do today. Some of them didn't have it. Like Zuhair ibn Qayn, they say he was an Uthmani. He was a follower of Uthman bin Affan, the third Khalifa. He was a, a fan of his. Yet there was one argument that you could never beat. No matter which side you were on, whether you believed in imamah the way we do today, whether you didn't believe in imamah, that was the close kinship to the Holy Prophet. That was something everyone was after. How can I be a relative of the, of the Holy Prophet? The imams would remind the people that, hey, at the end of the day, the relationship we have with the Holy Prophet, nobody else has. That's the least, the bare minimum. Enough for you to respect us and revere us and hold us highly. So Imam Hussein is no exception. Imam Rida, same thing. Imam Rida, let me share this with you. Imam Rida, salam, when he was forced to leave Medina and go all the way to Mashhad of today, Khurasan, when the Khalifa forced him to go, he kept going to the grave of the Holy Prophet and coming back. Kept going, coming back, weeping, letting everybody know that this is this is what I this is what I'm after. I'm forced to leave though. This is my holy grandfather, the Holy Prophet. Oh people. If I'm the eighth Imam, eight generations down, remember that I was the son of this Holy Prophet and I never made it back to Medina because he went to Mashhad and he was poisoned there after a few years. Imam Hussein is no exception. As I said yesterday, there's two accounts recorded of what was said when Imam Hussein would go to the grave of the Holy Prophet, although they say he went many more times. But two of those accounts have been recorded. One I shared with you yesterday, another I want to share with you today. Again here, he's letting history know what happened. He's letting history know what he was all about and whose life the people took in Karbala. It says he goes to the Holy Prophet's grave on another occasion. He says, Allahumma inna hadha qabru nabiyik. Oh Allah, this is verily the grave of your Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And I am the son of the daughter of your Prophet. And that of the decree that you know has befallen me, O oh Allah. In other words, that grand plan that Allah had is now being executed. Now is being carried out. It's starting, brothers and sisters. It's begun. Oh Allah, indeed I love good. Allahumma inni uhibbul ma'roof wa unkirul munkar. And I hate and despise evil. Oh wow, all right. Sometimes us as Shia, when we're doing things, when we have initiatives, when we're trying to serve humanity, sometimes you'll feel, you get the feeling that, oh, I better be careful because I am finding it, I'm developing an inclination towards certain things that the Sharia doesn't like. The Sharia dismisses as unacceptable. Sometimes the ends will justify the means for me. 
And so I will step over certain boundaries that Allah, Islam, the Sharia has set for a very good goal, of course. But if you remember yesterday, what did I say? And I was just echoing what Islam says. That in Islam, the ends don't justify the means. As a matter of fact, let's go a step further. The ends are the means. The means that you use, that you take to reach a certain goal, to reach a certain ends, that is exactly what it's all about. Allah wants to see what means you're going through to reach certain goals in life. So I want to serve humanity. That's awesome. Good for you. You have ikhlas. Yeah, I do. Very good. But in the, in the process, some, some boundaries are crossed. I don't want to give examples because I don't want to offend anybody. But it happens all the time. Imam Hussain, he has a goal. He says there's a grand plan, oh Allah, that is started very well. But I'm letting the world know that inni uhibbul ma'roof, I love that which is good, which the sharia of course says. Wa unkirul munkar. And I have a problem with whatever makes Allah upset. Bring, recite a salawat, please. It's a common problem. Usually this happens. I'm, the mic is usually low for me. All right. وَأَسْأَلُكَ يَا ذَا الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ And I ask you, O possessor of, possessor of majesty and bounty, بِحَقِّ هَذَا الْقَبْرِ By the right of this grave of the Holy Prophet. وَمَنْ فِيهِ And the one buried in it. Wow, that's another point right here. I just want to say on the side. He says, Oh Allah, by the right of this grave and the one buried in it. In other words, the grave itself holds a significance. Of course, its significance comes from the Holy Prophet. Yes, that is buried in there. But it's not just the Holy Prophet that now bears significance. The significance the Holy Prophet has transferred also to the grave itself. This is a nice point on the side. I just wanted to share. That he points out the grave, singles out the grave and the Holy Prophet's body, which is within that grave. He says, Oh Allah, I ask... By the right of these two. That you choose for me that which satisfies you. Wow. Remember yesterday we talked about this a little bit? It's about what he wants. The result, who cares what the result is? I have to take the first step if I know I have to do something. Whether the result will be in my favor or not, that's up to him. Even if it's not, quote unquote, in my favor, still it's in my favor. Why? Because I did what I was supposed to do. Abu Abdullah says, there's a plan that you have, oh Allah, one. Two, I'm taking the first step. I'm leaving Medina. I can't do anything else. Three, oh Allah, make, give me the tawfiq. Help me succeed in what? Taking over Kufa and then the Muslim empire. Becoming Khalifa, does he say that? Or he says, oh Allah, I'm doing what I need to do, you do what you need to do. When we do something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we leave the result in his hands. No one found out that I did such and such and such and such. Well, that wasn't the goal, the goal was him. Back then, everyone was happy that they have killed Imam Hussein, and it's all over. Yes? What did Lady Zainab say, alayhi salam? We've all heard that famous line, مَا رَأَيْتُ إِلَّا جَمِيلًا yeah? what, what was so nice, what was jameel and beautiful about what happened in Ashura? Nothing was beautiful. They're looking at it from Allah's lens. That's what makes it beautiful. It was all, it was all an, ex, an exhibition of servitude and submission. The result, Allah knows how, what the result is. The result for back then might have been something that you wouldn't wish for. But that's what made Allah satisfied, and that's why you and I are sitting here today as followers of Ahlul Bayt. We are the result. Alhamdulillah. And I thank all of you taking time out of your schedules to come to programs like these. We're all very busy. He says, And also that which is satisfying to your Holy Prophet. In other words, the Holy Prophet is alive still, he's watching. His satisfaction is the Lord's satisfaction. This is the second account that we have of Imam Hussain what he said to the Holy Prophet in one of those visits, one of those many visits. One of the two record, uh, records that we have 
What we find in this is a whole lesson. I covered all the points that are in it. I don't want to go over them again. This is the fourth thing that we have on our list of sayings of Imam Hussein before he leaves Medina. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. As we go on, things are going to get a little more complicated. Now, one person out there finds out that Imam Hussein has made the decision to leave for Mecca. Who is that? That is Lady Um Salma or Um Salama. Um Salama, who is she? Um Salama is one of the wives of the Holy Prophet. These wives of the Holy Prophet have seen Al Hasanain, you know, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein growing up, how the Prophet deals with them, how the Prophet takes care of them, how the Prophet shows his love to them. The, out of the wives of the Prophet, some of them, of course, the Shia school is critical of. Others of them, like Lady Um Salma, we revere very highly to the extent that we have hadith. Shaykh al Saduq narrates that after Lady Khadija, the next wife of the Holy Prophet, the highest wife of the Holy Prophet, is this Lady Um Salma. Why? She was there for Lady Fatima when her rights were usurped, when she was oppressed. She wrote letters, they say. She wrote a letter to Aisha telling her that she shouldn't start and engage in the battle of Jamal. They say she wrote letters to Muawiyah trying to get in the way of what he was doing. She was there for Ahlul Bayt always and loved Ahlul Bayt. Now I want to share a story with you here because she's worried now. She comes to Imam Hussein before he's leaving from Medina and she tells him that she's, uh, she's heard that, oh, you're leaving Hussein. What's going on? Why? Why are you so worried, Um Salma? Let's sh let me share a story with you. This is very famous. Alhamdulillah, this is all over uh, Sunni narrations, all over Sunni sources as well. You find this hadith all over the place. It says that كان النبي في بيت أم سلمة. The Prophet was in the home of Um Salma once. فقال لها لا يدخل علي أحد. Don't let anybody enter upon me. فجاء الحسين. Hussein was a young kid. He comes. And she wasn't able to get in his way. So somehow, Imam Hussein made his way into the room of the Holy Prophet. The Prophet had said, I don't want anybody coming. She tries to grab him. He, he gets away. He runs in. She runs after him. And she, when she enters the room of the Prophet, she sees that Imam Hussein is on the chest of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. Wa idha nabiyyu yabki, the Prophet is weeping. Wa idha fi yadihi shayun yuqabbiluhu, and the Prophet had something in his hand and he's kissing that. So the Prophet says, Ya Um Salama, inna hada Jibrail yuqabbiruni anna hada maktulun. That O oh, Um Salama, Jibrail is here and he's letting me know. He's informing me. That this one, this child, is maktul, shall be slain. And this is the soil that he's going to be martyred on. God knows what Karbala is, brothers and sisters. God knows. That before Ashura, this soil, there's something special about it. I don't know. and keep this soil habibi. Keep this soil with you when you see it turn red. We've all heard this story, right? Until today people try to find soil that turns red on Ashura. Well, that's okay, fine. But Imam Hussein is more than that. But this soil that the Prophet gave to Um Salma, he said, keep it, and when you see it turn red, you now you will know that my love, my beloved Hussein has been killed and slain. فَقَالَتْ أُمْ سَلْمَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ سَلِ اللَّهِ أَنْ يَدْفَعَ ذَلِكْ عَانْتْ Why don't you ask Allah to repel this from your beloved Hussein? قَالْ قَدْ فَعَلْتُ فَأَوْحَ اللَّهِ I did, I asked. But revelation came أَنَّ لَهُ دَرَجَةً لَا يَنَالُهَا أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمَخْلُقِينَ That he has a special place in Jannah. That none of his creation is going to reach. Apparently because of this shahada, of course. 
So this shahada has to take place, this martyrdom has to take place. Of course, we'll talk about this more later. وَأَنَّ لَهُ shia. If someone says, oh, that wasn't, we didn't get the result we wanted out of Ashura because everyone was slain. أَنَّ لَهُ shia. That he's going to have some Shia and followers. يَشْفَعُونَ فَيُشَفَّعُونَ They will do shafa'a. And the hadith goes on. So ladies, Umm Salma, they say, kept this soil. But she knows a day is going to come that her, love, her beloved Hussein is going to be killed in Karbala. Now she hears that Hussein is leaving Medina. Imam Hussein doesn't leave Medina usually. What's going on? I have to leave. For where? What's, what hap what's happening? Umm Salma hears about this. She says, don't grieve me with your departure to Iraq. Verily, I have heard your grandfather say that my son Hussein will be killed in a land called Karbala in Iraq. This is the part that Imam Hussein says. He says, Ya Ummah, O Mother. Because as you all know, the wife of the Holy Prophet is mahram to Imam Hussein. All the wives of the Prophet are. They're like the grandmother to them. So this is like his mother. He calls her, Oh, Ya Ummah, Oh Mother. وَأَنَا أَعْلَمُ أَنِّي مَقْتُولُ I know that I will be slain. مَذْبُوحٌ Slaughter. ظُلْمًا Out of oppression. وَعُدْوَانًا Out of animosity. Yes, there's, there's narrations that say on Ashura when they were killing Imam Hussein and he was asking, Why do you kill me? They said, بُغْدًا لِأَبِيكِ Out of animosity. Out of hate for your father. Yes, there was animosity. Allah wants to see this. And this is the part we want to talk about a little bit. Allah wills to see me. Harami, my haram, my women. Warahti musharradin. He wants to see my women, my children, musharradin. Scattered. وَأَطْفَالِي مذبوحين. My children slaughtered. After Imam Hussein was slaughtered on Ashura, some children were killed as well, they say. مأسورين. Taken prisoner. مقيدين. Shackled in chains. وَهُمْ يَسْتَغِيثُونَ فَلَا يَجِدُونَ نَاصِرًا And they ask them calling out and wailing. Fleeing for help, but they don't find anyone to help them. Allah wants to see this. What do you think uh, Lady Umm Salma does? Of course, she's upset now. and She's, she's weeping. But Imam Hussein is saying, this is, this is something that has to happen. If this has to happen, the whole universe comes and tries to stand in my way. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to go. Umm Salma, ya ummah. Mother. Fatimah Zahra was my mother, they killed my mother. You were someone that was like my mother, but I have to leave you. Why? Allah has willed. Allah has willed. Look at the determination, solid, of Abba Abdullah. A follower of Imam Hussain, inshallah, is also going to be solid. Solid what? Where? Every day of their life. When the wajib and haram of Allah comes up, they're going to be solid. Some people have this argument of, oh, one night will not equal a thousand nights. Okay, it's just one night that I'm committing this haram, it's going to be over. This gathering, that gathering, I don't know, whatever, so on, so forth. Solid. Abu Abdullah was solid. If he knows Allah wants something, he doesn't care about anything else. She doesn't know, Umm Salma, that the Imam has to go on this journey. Because this isn't a normal journey. This is a journey that will never end, brothers and sisters. As long as time goes on, this journey of Hussein and Ashura is going to go on. Till today. Alhamdulillah. Now we have a question here. The question is, why? What's wrong with Astaghfirullah? I'm sorry to say this, but why? what is wrong with God? What is wrong with God that... He wants to see this. Because Imam Hussein says, Allah wants to see this. What is wrong here with God, astaghfirullah? That he wants to see Imam Hussein like this. Go through this. You know, atheists sometimes point these things out. 
For Prophet Ibrahim, they will mock Prophet Ibrahim. Because Prophet Ibrahim, his story is in the Old Testament, of course. That God wants him to slay his son and sacrifice his son, right? They'll make fun. Like, what kind of God is this? <laughs> so the same question will be posed here. What kind of God is this? God wants to see all of this tragedy. Now I'm going to get a little technical here for you guys, okay? Brothers and sisters, there are two wills. When someone wills something, you don't have to remember this, but just try to follow. There is one willing that has to do with creation. When Allah wills something, it is created. It comes into existence. إِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ When Allah wants something, He wishes it, He wills it, and all of a sudden it is. It means it exists. Yes? Question. Tree, human being that comes into existence. Do they have a choice when it comes to this will? No. They come into existence whether they like it or not. This will is called a taqweeni will. Taqween has to do with creation. How things are in their existence. Sometimes Allah wills something like that, I have no choice. Sometimes Allah wills something, but it's not that type of willing. He has willed for us to pray. Do, are we forced to pray? No. Yet He wants it. He wants it. He has willed a lot of things for us. These are legislative, they call them. Tashri'ah. comes from Sharia. Ah. Tashri this is his tashri'i ah will. This is his desire for us. Are we forced when it comes to this form of willing and wishing that God has? No. Nope. We can do whatever we want. Now if we do what he wishes, we are rewarded later. And maybe on the spot even. In this dunya and in the hereafter maybe. One or both. If we go against His will, we're not forced to do it, and it won't happen. But on the Day of Judgment, we're going to regret it. Yeah, This tashri'i will is something that has, is governing everything almost, when it comes to our actions. He wants us to do things, but we're not forced to do them. He wants the Kaaba to be sanctified. He wants the, 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 the respect of the Kaaba to be upheld. But as I said yesterday, one of the tragedies that took place in the time of Yazid was what? The Kaaba was set ablaze, they say. Did God get in the way of that? Did God get in the way of Imam Hussein being killed? No. Because he has willed it, but it's still the free will is there for us. But he'll take care of business later on the other side, of course. Let's not forget that part. All right? After the, on the Day of Judgment, things will be taken care of. But not, now they won't, and we're not forced to question now is when Imam Hussein says Allah has willed to see me Allah has willed me to see me to see, has willed to see me and my family go through this which form of these two is it is it the one that we're forced to no matter what or it's one of those wills that Allah says this is what I want for, from you let's see if you're going to fulfill it or not this is the first question answer this is just like Ahsant. This is just like when Allah wills for us to do salat. He says, This is your duty. This is your duty. And you should do it. And then he's gonna, I'm being metaphorical here, he's gonna sit back and watch and see what we do. Imam Hussein says, Allah has willed for me to be killed. Willed here means that he wants to see. This is his wish. He wants to see if I'm gonna live up to it or not. Number one. Number two. When Allah wishes for certain things, but we're not forced to do them. Assuming that Allah is in no need of anything, when He wishes for something for us, it, the good is for us, right? The good comes back to us. There's a greater good in it, somehow. Sometimes we understand, sometimes we don't. For example, He says, لا تقول له ما أفن. Don't, say, don't say anything to your parents that's going to offend them. That's going to hurt their feelings. We can understand the good in that. These are my parents, come on. All their life they've, they've spent uh, time and energy and money raising me and then I'm going to disrespect them. We can understand the good in that. Sometimes we don't understand it. Salat al-Fajr is two rak'ah. Why God? That's the test. I just want to see you're going to listen or not. But you know it's for your own good. 
I want to do 10. I'm just feeling super spiritual today. Well, you're going to go to hell for 10 rakat. That's not worth it, man. Yeah? Think about it. Some people, they get punished for going out. It's like they get punished for something that wasn't worth it here. I'm, I'm going to be punished on the Day of Judgment because I fasted on purpose on, on Eid al-Fitr, although I knew it was haram. Like, if you're going to go to hellfire, like, do something that's worth it at least. You know what I'm saying? Salat al-Fajr, two rak'ah. Why, O oh Allah? He says, there's something good in it. I know you don't. I'm, I'm telling you. Shaitan, O oh Allah, why do I have to do sajda to, to Adam? I'm better than him. Allah says, no, no, there's something going on here you don't know. And he failed the test. And so on and so forth. All of these tashri'i commands of Allah. Where we have a choice. At the end of the day, we know that behind the scenes, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of knowledge that Allah has that we don't have of the benefits of things, of the advantages of things. I mean, you and I are sitting here today, 1400 years later, we can easily understand the good behind Ashura. Back then, the enemies of Islam, though, didn't know. They thought they were victorious, but they weren't. They thought they were. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Imam Hussein, I want to see this happen. In other words, it means, hey, the, the situation has gotten so dire and Islam is in such danger that the purest of blood has to be spilled so that people wake up. People didn't wake up in Saqifah. People didn't wake up in the second, they call it Saqifah, which is when there was a six-person council and Uthman was elected as Khalifa. People didn't wake up then. People didn't wake up in the battle of Jamal, Siffin. They didn't wake up then. <clears throat> People didn't wake up. They didn't wake up, stayed in their slumber. Now we need a big movement. Something has to shake mankind and Islam. The Ummah, the Islamic nation, the purest of blood has to be spilled. Imam Hussein, you are the last of the five members of the cloak. Be sure that if Imam Sajjad's blood had been spilled, brothers and sisters, instead of Imam Hussein, it wouldn't have had the same effect. Imam Hussein was the last hope. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees this. The situation is like this. To save Islam, there's only one way out. Imam Hussein's blood has to be spilled. Here Allah says, I will, I have willed, and I want to see that you become shaheed. Oh Abu Abdullah. Is it because Allah has a problem? No. It's because the people had a problem after the Prophet passed away all the way till Ashura. And of course Islam is a more important. The Imams, the Prophet, they came for Islam. They gave their lives for Islam. So if Islam is to survive only through the means of the Shahada of Imam Hussein on Ashura, and Allah is willing it, it's because of the greater good in it. This is the meaning of Imam, what Imam Hussein says when he says that Allah has willed to see me and my family go through all of this pain and suffering. There's no other choice. But he doesn't, he doesn't retreat when he knows that this is his wadifa. And he starts this journey. He starts this journey, he takes the first step and he leaves Medina. There are a few more um, incidents that take place a few more dialogues, inshallah, that we're going to cover tomorrow, are, which are also of the utmost importance. They give us an understanding, an idea of how the people were during Imam Hussein's time. How they looked at the Imam. How they looked at the situation. How they had identified the problems of that time. And it all shows itself in the way they speak to the Imam as the Imam wants to leave Medina. Inshallah, I will leave that for tomorrow. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوات